how I feel it. All right. You feeling good? Yeah. You feel some feminine? Yeah. You feel really pain? All right, something. <laughs> great, great. Okay, so um, welcome. I was like, what are we missing? <laughs> We're missing the main attraction at the moment. Um, happy Wednesday. Thank you for being here. My name is Janita Pindara Potter. I use she or they. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Narrative Change at the Women's Foundation. What's up, Women's Foundation? What? <laughs> Be sure you know and speak who they are. They're amazing colleagues of mine. Uh, welcome to conversation two of Rad Girl Summer about radical resourcing. We have some amazing heavy hitters. These are all celebs. I don't need to do bio, so you can just Google them, right? <laughs> all right, so um, before we get started, I want to do a land and ancestors acknowledgement. So as we gather today, please join me in honoring the sacred lands in which we live, learn, and work. The land we call Minnesota includes the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of love and sovereign nation. We pay homage to those who are here before us on this land, the seven Anishinaabe nations of the Chippewa and Ojibwe, and the four Dakota nations. Along with these 11 tribes, we honor all the indigenous peoples of this territory, many of tribes which were never formally recognized by the government. Furthermore, by respecting our purpose for being here today, it is important to also acknowledge Black ancestors who were taken from their homeland and brought here to volunteer to build this nation as we know. We acknowledge those before us, those among us, and those who are yet to come. We have a role in acknowledging our history and are responsible for the journey in, in healing, resourcing, and reparation. So throughout the whole night, thank you. Throughout the whole night, we invite you to connect with any of our amazing friends at the Coven, um, Ash, and Tight, and of course, Alex, and so many others, um, and also my WFM colleagues, um, and also, if we can just take a moment to connect on our social media. Oh, we'll go back to the first slide. Pull out your phones, please, because we just need to take a moment. Who would be, who would be fun? So can you take a selfie? Come on, people. All right, follow us on socials. You know what to do. It's there. It's a little bit covered. Sorry. Um, but uh, make sure you take a quick selfie. Can we take a quick selfie of some sort? Okay. Maybe. All right. Hold on. Where's my? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So I was asked to start, please. Uh, check with the front desk or the bathroom. I do not know the bathroom code. Um, if you parked in the building lot, make sure you don't forget to get your parking validated. And lastly, listen to your body if you smell when you smell, okay? Um, how many of you know um, about the Women's Foundation? Oh, cool. Okay. Thank you. Good job, comms team. All right. So we're going to play just a really quick game together, okay? So quick tri trivia. I'm going to say this because you might win a couple cool swag. I don't know. Check in with our team. How long has the foundation been around? All right, 40 years. Yes. Give it up. Give it up. Thank you. Look at your swag from Delica in the back. Thank you. All right. Who do we serve? Easy. <laughs> what was that? Women, girls, gender expansive people. Yes, that's right. All right. And then who was the first person? Who was the first person to make a transformative gift? And how much? Staff did not answer. <laughs> it was Mary Lee Dayton who gave the first one million dollars. Um, so yes, really fun fact. All right, you all are winners. So go get your swag from us at the resource table. All right, thank you. Um, so what do we do? We fund transformative futures for women, girls, and gender expansive people, and we've been doing that since 1983. So um, we funded over 200 organizations on an annual basis, and we have funded more than $49 million in the past 40 years. 
And we also have a lady who is also a lot. First of all, thank you. So um, I'll, I'll introduce also our speakers. So we have the amazing Alex. Give it up for Alex. <laughs> Alex Chris Simon is an award-winning entrepreneur, speaker, co-founder of Coven, uh, the first woman-owned co-working franchise in the world. Oh, my God. So I'm a baker who has a 25 year career in the most recent section of philanthropy, business, government, and community. As an experienced CEO, CEO, and asking you know, you're not going to become an employee for leadership. China has seen success in complex innovation, recognizing national talent, and dating. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I give up on this time. It's beautiful. This is amazing. Come on, China. And then Tawana Black. Tawana Black is an award-winning architect of racially, racially inclusive and equitable talent, supply chain, philanthropy, marketing strategies that yield transformational results for businesses, their consumers, and the communities they work in. Um, give it up to, to Tawana, please. Alex said that she came out Thank you for being here, Paula. Um, and then last but not least, we have Kate. I'm going all the way down here. Kate Downing Cleave. She is the founder and CEO of Imagine Deliver, a certified B4 nationally award-winning insights and strategy consulting firm, a proud Muslim American based in St. Paul. Kate is an inclusive designer who focuses her skills on developing services and systems that drive equitable outcome, outcomes in philanthropy, community development, healthcare, government, and financial services. Give it up for Kay. Okay. So before we get started, we thought that we would provide a little bit of context of what is philanthropy. We're here for all that resources. So I just want to pass it over real quick to Shanta. <laughs> this is still the Dominican Republic, y'all. Physically shaped care. Okay, yes, yes. All right, Shana, I would love for you to share a little bit about kind of the history of philanthropy and the role of community foundation. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that. So one, I'll start with the uh, Women's Foundation since we are in a celebratory year. And um, I was recently at the Minneapolis Foundation and there was Mary Lee Baby and others that came together to establish a fund. That fund um, was created then at the Minneapolis Foundation where it grew and then eventually moved off to become its own foundation. And so I love the evolutionary stories that often it's just a few people that get frustrated and like probably I can just anticipate and imagine the conversations that are similar to what we're having today. What about women? How do we fit? Who's making investments? What should that look like? Who should be doing it? Oh, it's us. <laughs> um, and then move forward. And so to be uh, a part of uh, yet another story in which uh, people with great ideas came together, and now 40 years later, that legacy has been built upon and has grown to uh, the facts that uh, Janita shared with me. I think community foundations are very unique in that um, they are really many people coming together with their funds, donor advised funds in other ways. So it's not, doesn't work the same way as other foundations, but there's lots of people that park money. I always say community foundations largely are charitable checkbooks and or communities that are built around investing in communities in a way that matter collectively. And so that's what the benefit and the beauty is um, to be able to do that and to do that over generations. And so um, most foundations, I mean, there's nuances, but ultimately it is about reinvesting money into community to advance, um, advance the issues that we care about. What do we do about the situation of women at work? What do we do about the situation of women not fighting against people not being taken seriously, um, not advancing in leadership in the industry that I come from, which is advertising, not much has changed in the last. Um, and so looking at each other and staring at each other as friends, um, the four co-founders kind of said, well, I guess 
we have to do something because no one else is doing it. Um, and when you really take initiative, something really beautiful comes up, um, comes from it. Pink waters, uh, pink waters management. Um, but I did want to just say thank you so much for all three of you being here. I've, I've known each of you different in different situations, so it's exciting to be sitting um, next to such powerhouses and folks who really um, built built organizations that hold space for community, that resource community in positive ways. And today is really all about radical resourcing. So when I talk about resourcing, I'm not talking just about human beings. I'm like literally talking about money. Like, so let's just call it what it is. We're talking about salad availability, y'all. So um, with today's uh, conversation, we want to really want to talk about how women have really been leading the way in radical resourcing. We truly are. We are consistent. We look to, to um, solve the problems, uh, uh, find the solutions, and, and grow businesses, grow organizations. And we're often not recognized for it. So I'm, I'm excited to recognize the three people next to me. I'd love to ask all of you, and I'll just um, I'll actually maybe start with Tawana here. How do you see women leading in this area of radical resourcing, and, and what ways are you doing it in your work? Well, first, thanks for convening this conversation, both to you, Mary Coven, and to the Women's Foundation. Um, so in our work at the Center for Economic Inclusion, we see women leading in a few ways, and we're investing ourselves in that work. So the first is we're focused specifically on women in business and in women as employers, and recognizing that women of color, in particular um, African-American women, indigenous women, and Latino women, and Asian women um, as well, we've taken a specific focus on African-American women and Latino women as job creators, given both the statistics of our history as job creators, but also the statistics of wealth extraction in our communities that have kept us from being able to create jobs in those domains that are growing the fastest in our market. And so we've taken a specific focus over the last few years of being able to bring capital into the market, connections into the market, and contracts into the market that would position women to do what we already know how to do, what we're positioned sometimes to be able to do, but often haven't had those opportunities and the capital to be able to do, and then to be able to push more of those institutions who exist in our market, whether those are CDCs, community development corporations, or lending institutions, or training institutions, banks, um, uh, corporations who contract, or government institutions who contract, to do what they're already doing, but better and more intentionally, to recognize that we're here. We have talent, we have opportunity, but need to be specifically included in that job creation so that we have both the call and the will to, but the opportunity to create jobs that pay family sustaining wages. They're in those fields that are not going to be displaced because of automation or because of augmentation. And that we're getting those real opportunities, not just the talk about it opportunities, but the real one and the specific way of really creating that opportunity that we went about that was first to do the research and say like how to make sure we know those fields so that we're not just talking chicken or egg and really see a lot of people who are doing good things but often say I just don't know like what are the things people purchase in our market and how do I know how to do that and companies who say well I would buy from them but I don't know who they are I don't know what they're selling so we did the research to get out of that game of I just don't know and then put that out there and then brought the capital to that table and started making forgivable loans of twenty-five, fifty, and a hundred thousand dollars to people who were in business, but often getting a real loan um, that was going to be debt was not the answer for them, or it might be the answer, but they couldn't get that. And I've really been able to help a number of businesses by putting more than a million dollars into the market in just this year alone, and seeing several businesses owned by our community start to just create jobs over and over and over, and then propel those dollars into more dollars that help them get on the shelves of our local stores, get contracts among companies that all of us know and do business with, but also begin to drive accountability in places where we really need to see people put up or shut. I want to come back to, um, we'll do this in the next question, but I want to ask more about that specific resource, um, the specific resource and the specificity of the people we are working with. Um, but I want to move on to Kate first and ask a little bit more about the work that you're doing and how it's radical resource and um, show up in your work. Great. Can everyone hear me? Oh, here, we, here we go. Yeah. Alex told me I needed to eat the mic. Eat so I was going to talk. Um, a couple of ways. One, Imagine Deliver is a fairly new company. We launched in 2017. Um, and bootstrapped our way to grow and been growing consistently. So um, that's not something we see a lot. 
uh, in our community in terms of, we were a very entrepreneurial community of women, but that type of growth um, is, is really, really challenging um, and has been supported in a number of different ways that I can talk about later. Um, I'm also a strategy consultant working with philanthropy, financial services, um, and other organizations to think about different mechanisms for building wealth specifically um, for intersectional women, uh, Black women specifically right now. Tawana, Alex and I have a both working project with the McKnight Foundation to focus on Black wealth building. So I've learned a lot about, about financial systems and how they um, are built to keep us all out. Um, and how we might rebuild them differently in the way that Tawana's organization is um, to have much more accessible ways of building businesses and making entrepreneurship scale. So I'm really excited to talk about that with all of you today. Thank you. Yeah, and I think there's something really unique about the um, the funding system that we currently have, which is built on you know like. Uh, funding black owned businesses as a charitable service versus it being like an asset or a true like growth opportunity for organizations that's like a new concept from an asset framing perspective. So it's been really interesting to be a part of this project called the Groundbreak Coalition, which is what um, Kate mentioned, um, where we're really trying to change um, sustainable funding for black owned businesses. So it's not a, um, a, a nice to do, but it's a must do. Yeah. Um, and it's something that Tawana has been leading the way and I'm, I'm excited to be um, riding your <laughs> riding on your wings um, <laughs> as we as we head into the solution for that project. Um, Shana, can you talk a little bit about radical resourcing in your life and how women are leading the way in the way that you stand at um, organizations that are part of? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, first women are at the core of almost everything and every crevice of, of our community and of our state. And so we are fueling things as we know how to do them in those spaces, including supporting what is happening there. That our investments, um, our contributions, our narratives and our legacies are not expressed. They're not documented in the same way for us to be able to build on those lessons in the ways that I think we should. And so. I have been part of a number of narrative efforts, including a podcast that I have um, in conversation with Shonda, but I'm doing a, a series right now in relationship with um, Voice Vision Value, Black Women Leading in Philanthropy, that is featuring um, different women um, every Wednesday this month and then a Wednesday every month. And I bring that up because um, as I listen to those stories of how people are thinking of new ways to think about investing in our community. It's leading the way for everyone else. And that um, by sharing those stories, I think we can then build upon those ideas. And so I think the narrative is important on not just what we're doing, but do I belong in what is happening what the future looks like? So I think being able to break through uh, those barriers are, are incredibly important down to the Freedom, uh, is it the Freedom Fund in Atlanta? I think that's the one that's being sued, Fearless Fund, the Fearless Fund. So you have all these radical new ways um, that people are coming in and making investments. And you can see that the fights are still embedded in everything. And so the idea of women coming together, Alex, thank you for your work in that. But I think that as we um, build together, it's, it's, it's easier for us to move further, faster, better. Um, but we can also attack against the attacks that we know will come and we can build on the wisdom that exists uh, collectively. And so um, certainly the narrative change, the work that Loli, Mola, I and Rapa have done to start the Black Collective Foundation, which we're very excited about, Minnesota's first Black um, community foundation focused on investing in the genius, the genius of Black change. And that was birthed out of um, George Floyd's murder and us thinking about where do we need to continue to go to combat anti-Blackness um, that exists. And so um, I think that um, there are many examples, and I think we need more examples of those things that grow in scale, Alex, and to be able to elevate and showcase them um, more broadly. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm glad I brought up the famous friend. Uh, that's one of my questions for Tawana here in a second. I wanted to kind of back up though and talk a little bit about right, resourcing and what are some of those creative ways of funding that's typically, you know, a lot of folks 
talk about like, well, just find a creative way to fund your business and like, well, how? <laughs> so um, we have to really talk about what those what those opportunities are. And um, being the, one of the co-founders of the company, we found a lot of different ways that we've resourced um, our business because when we opened our first, when we opened on the first day, we didn't have I know access to a bank that was willing to give four women a lot of money to give black women um, a lot of money. And one of the things that I struggled with was like the fact that I had run multi-million dollar accounts on in advertising. I had, you know, a decade of experience as a leader, uh, but that wasn't enough um, to resource our business. And so we had to turn to the community um, and we opened up a, a, a crowdfunding campaign, which basically we were pre-selling founding memberships back in 2018 when crowdfunding was a brand new thing on a platform called iFundWomen. Um, we ended up raising $350,000 on the platform because we had something that people wanted, which was exciting. Um, but it was it was a slog. It was five months of like knocking, you know, 112 copies a day. It was very cheap for, <laughs> for the entire year of 2017. Um, but it was something that I know uh, male founders, white male founders, white women founders don't have to deal with every single day. And so I found that to be such a, um, you know, people were like, well, you're so resilient. Like, good job. Like, I can't believe you did that. I'm like, yeah, I can't believe I fucking did it too. Like, <laughs> I can't believe I have to do it. And so, you know, we're, we're at it again. We raised $1.6 million in um, funding from institutional investors after proving ourselves for five years. I feel really proud of that. But we have to raise two two point five million dollars, so I'm closing the gap with another crowdfunding campaign, um, VOB funder, and so we're turning to something that's more of like an equity crowdfunding. So that's another tool and resource that we've used because again, going to a bank and saying we have a co-working space, the physical community, they're like, well, what assets do you have? I'm like, it's a co-working space, the physical community, they're like, you don't own anything. I'm like, ah. so it's a frustrating process when you build something, you built a dream, you. You've done something really incredible, um, and yet still people don't see the benefit of it, of, of a profitable business. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I wanted to share that there are other ways of finding resources. Those are our tools, and I hope that you find them as like resources and tools. I'm always happy to talk about that. I'd love to turn to Kate, too, who's also grown her own business, and ask a little bit more about your own personal experience bootstrapping a company, what that looks like, um, and, and how you found resources in the community creatively. Well, I promise we would be real, <laughs> and, we, right. and we would and we would tell the truth. I um certainly uh did not have uh a lot of beautiful examples of successful entrepreneurs in my life to look to um growing up. So when I founded this company, and I and I also did not have means, and so when I founded this company in 2017. I spent three years not profitable and I literally saved my way to being able to hire my first employee. And then it wasn't until 2020 that I found a bank that was willing to, no, sorry, the beginning of 2021 that I found a bank that was willing to give me a loan to grow. Um, also, I'm a Muslim woman, so interest-based financing is not something that works well for me and my faith values, and so accessing capital has been really hard. Um, I have a lot of social capital, community that supported me, people who hired us, and people also don't want to see women's services, businesses grow and scale beyond organizations of one. And so getting... <laughs> Getting to a place where I could hire really amazing, diverse, top talent that reflects the community who has a good eye for inclusive design has been really challenging just to actually make the case to charge the type of money that we can. And that's something we continue to face every single day. We're always the most expensive contract. We are always you know, fighting to keep the group together. And we were very lucky to have made a commitment to set a baseline of not paying anyone any less than a full-time salary employment with benefits. It's not perfect and it's certainly not enough. And we need to get to a place where it's an even greater thriving wage, but that requires collective pushing on our various sectors to be able to command um, different types of pricing because doing good matters 
but people want you to think that you have to do good while sacrificing significant portions of, of your well-being in order to do that. So um, I don't know if that's not as uplifting, um, but it's true. And when I was asked to join a panel about radical resourcing, I had to turn, you know, to my to my team and say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good at talking about this for what we're building for the future for the community. But when I think about what I have to offer the conversation, I think about, well, I'm, I don't feel like I'm there yet. And I have, and certainly I've been building a successful company and there are lots of assets that are invisible, certainly great social capital, good financial capital and solid running. But there's a long way to go before it feels like I'm Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> And I said to Katie, I said, like, my spirit, we got issues, but my spirit is going to say, like, there's a need to come in this space and have a real conversation about what it takes and what it means to build a true business that is thriving. And we have regular caucuses about, like, okay, let's get over some cash issues and back into you. That's what I need. Um, I don't remember what you usually get, but, um, <laughs> like, the caucus of, like, okay, let's sit here and cry over, like, how sick and hard this really is. To be able to not cut payroll and to really make it and then have people sit in your face and tell you they're supportive and yet go out and trash and try to destroy the machine all at the same doggone time. Like, let's sit and be real about this and then let's go back out here and go do the work for another six months. And so I think that space about really how do you resource it? And I read an article about you just last week actually that encouraged me about that very story about what it took to be able to do that early fundraising and then go back out there. And when I read that, like, oh, shoot, she's doing it again the same way. It was encouragement for me and yet angry at the same time. To say, like, <laughs> we're all in it the same way, right? It takes having to do it over and over and over again the same way. And that it will take, though I appreciate Shonda's notion, that it takes women who believe in women who go out and disrupt the system in the same way that when we talk about what does it take to get women to run for office and have them be successful, it's the same thing in every way. It's women who are willing to not just go invest in one, but to actually invest in disrupting the whole entire system. At the same time that you're investing in 10, and then telling that narrative story about the success, because we're good at like telling about the 10 things that are horrible, but like, did you go tell the 10 things that are working too? about how it actually is working, like go tell that story because that's what starts to also change the formula for like, actually this can work. It actually doesn't have to look the way that you heard that it looked in those situations. It can work this way. It can work without that physical asset. Like we gotta tell those stories. Well, we don't have to tell them. You have to tell, you have, somebody has to tell you how to do it a way. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it's not the easiest way uh, along, along the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, when I think about the different ways that I have been enterprising, um, sometimes it's been, um, you know, on my own and didn't have to say something now, or whether or not it's been within institutions, you run into the same issue. So when I think about um, the work I did around North Market, I remember going out to get dollars for that and being turned down very early. and. Um, it wasn't really until the corporate community came in that philanthropic folks came in. And so there, there is different strategies to get there. Um, and I was fortunate enough that the no got me to a better yes. And there was a whole bunch of no's that came to me even getting to North Market. Um, it started out as a contract, by the way, to advance WIC. And I just kept being told no. And then finally, I'm like, I'm going to open up a fucking grocery store. <laughs> Um, which is really exactly what I said in my office, right? But I remember getting um, some dollars for that that store um, when it was um, very young in terms of its evolution. And um, the man who supported me in getting the money said, if it doesn't work, you will never be able to get money again for, for something like this. And um, I say that because those are the types of narratives that stick sometimes longer than the ones, right? So am I willing to risk my future, my family's future, and, and my finances on an idea? 
because if I wasn't confident about the way that I moved in this community moved, I would have turned around and sat down. And um, I think that is where the community comes in to say, no, it's a good idea, we've got your back. Uh, because often when we are making those moves, it comes at the cost to ourselves and our families. And I think that if we win, not I think when we know we are supported and people will stand in those gaps, similar to what you shared, Kate, and in Juana, in terms of you know your community came in and got you those early contracts, then we know that we can continue to put one foot in front of the other. Um, there are really interesting models, but unfortunately, um, you know, or to say the opportunity is for sort of confidence and um, timing and perspective that there's a convergence of those things that need to come together. And I think as we document those ways and those strategies, they can be useful. And I think that's what you're doing, Swan, is documenting them and allowing people to be able to learn from the lessons, lessons so they have to navigate um, less uh, bombs, <laughs> you know, sort of along the way. Um, you know, again, I think the other thing is that as I move from the foundation and I'm just basically, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, period. And um, even walking through that space, some people are like, oh, you know, I mean, a couple of people have responded that way. And so I think that there's something about giving room for people to be enterprising in a way that makes sense for them. Um, and, and, um, and I'm sure that I will be calling on you all as I encounter all of these things because I believe they're true. Um, but we have seen some wildly successful things. So I'm excited yeah. for that. Kind of being in a moment where, you know, someone's going to be like, are you willing to risk everything? And um, it, we call that sad tacos night at the government. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it refers to a moment when we raised our first 350000 on crowdfunding. And we had our first event. We launched the crowdfunding campaign. We had like a yoga and wine night. And we were like, everybody come. and Everybody buying their first founding membership and it's gonna be really exciting. And like 50, 40 people show up and it was so awesome. Everyone like high fives at the end, they loved our pitch and nobody wrote us a check. And we were like sitting there with our iPads at the end and they're like, okay, give us your credit cards now. And no, everybody walked out. And it was one of those moments and they just left because it was like, thanks for allowing us to come to this event. See you later. And um so we were just like, we're like, oh my gosh, like this is gonna be so hard. And this was like October of 2017, we closed 350 in March of 2018. And so it took a long time to get there, but it was one of those moments where I realized like, am I willing to put in the work that it's gonna take to do this the hard way? Um, and that was the 750 coffees that left me shaking for three years. So I feel like, you know, I said yes to that. Sean has said yes to that. Joanna has said yes to that. Kate has said yes to those hard, those hard decisions that are really risky. Um, but it took like a moment like that, a sad taco moment, um, and really terrible margaritas that really got us through, um, got us through that moment. Um, I want to talk about one moment that's happening right now in, in history, and it's this uh, Supreme Court ruling, which as there are many, and so let me explain which terrible one I'm talking about. Um, but I'm talking about affirmative action um, in affecting Black, Brown, and women-owned businesses um, and the work that um, we're seeing tearing down a lot of organizations that have been stood up to support Black, Brown, and women-founded organizations and businesses in particular. So I want to give in your interest in, in the impact that you all have had, what are you seeing with the uh, fallout of that fearless fund, and how is it impacting your business? What do you see for the future? Good question. I think we're seeing a couple things um, in this moment, and if I have said to everyone who's asked us about this that, one, we can't take for granted that everybody is even paying attention to this moment in time. So for um, a fact, hopefully you've seen the, the notice of first having a lawsuit and then a Supreme Court ruling uh, that ruled that college admissions cannot, can no longer use race um, as the test for um, admitting students into college um, and then the funding that goes along with that. Um, the same uh, individual and, and institution that chose to file that lawsuit then filed a lawsuit um, against one of the leading organizations um, uh, that has been um, supporting women of color in particular um, uh, to start business uh, businesses and chose to, um, and this is important, to file that lawsuit against their nonprofit 
not against um, the for-profit arm that is actually doing venture investing, which is important um, as we all think about the ecosystem here on um, this doing that work um, as well. So very strategic um, uh, move and important for philanthropy in particular, given this room um, here. And so that lawsuit is out there um, and has a couple of implications that we're seeing in the ecosystem where we work. One is organizations like ours who operate a Vanguard fund that is specifically investing in Black and Latino women-owned businesses that has funds from Chase, just like the Fearless Fund does, having the wake-up moment to say, wait a minute, um, Chase, other funders, do you want to pull your dollars? The good news is all of those corporations at this moment are saying, no, keep going. We've got your back. We have no intentions of pulling back. That's good news. The second one is businesses, though, who have um, those Black and Latino women-owned businesses and others saying, wait a minute, what does this mean for us? And some fear point about we can still have the dollars. You're not going to pull back if you've made a, a loan investment. If you've made a venture investment, you're not going to claw back those dollars. But what does it mean for future dollars? And there is that fear point. I think the fear we've seen come up in just the last couple of weeks is significant, not just in this market, but in every city that we work in. We've seen that tick up higher. The third leg of that is then what about contracts? What about corporations who, let's be real, while we've had a large number of commitments made in the last three years since George Floyd was murdered, we have not seen a large increase in spending from those companies going back into our communities. So we, and we need that, right? We still need that happening. So the last thing we can afford is for companies to get scared and use this as a moment to say, oh, let's stop the 2% of spending we were doing and make that come back down to a half a percent. We can't afford that. And so there's a fear point. I don't, however, see that happening. What I see is those companies know they need the talent in our communities because the Supreme Court decision had just taken place regarding college admissions. And so many large corporations need that talent coming out of colleges to look like us. They need us getting college educations and they had just started to lean in for two weeks to colleges saying, wait a minute, we gotta make sure that your doors remain open. We've got to make sure that you are still reaching into communities of color to be sure that you're still bringing them through your doors. What do we need to do? Those who are serious in the first place here. I'm talking about those. I don't really care about those who, those who are opposed. So we haven't seen that immediate pullback. But that said, you got to be intentional. So I think it is the moment to keep the pressure on. So what we're saying to all of our partners, to Shana's point about solidarity, is lean in. Every place you spend your dollars, use your voice. Lift your voices high. Speak up and let it be known. If it's your dry cleaner, I don't care where it is that you spend your dollars, let them know my money counts. I want to know how you spend your dollars. I want to, I need to know how you're using those. Are you spending your dollars with Black and Latina and Indigenous and Asian women-owned businesses? And how do I know that? Let them know you want scorecards going out that really show the detail and not just national level scorecards, it matters where they spend those dollars. It matters if those dollars are being spent in your backyard, because this was the epicenter. Many of those corporations are headquartered here and they can hit those 2020, 2025, 2025 goals without ever increasing a dime of spending in MSP. And we wouldn't be the wiser. And that means no more jobs occur in our backyard. That means nobody's pockets are healthier in our backyard unless we hold them accountable for making sure that that pipeline is stronger and the spending increases. And that's the moment we're in here. It's more than a lawsuit for our communities. It's more, my child is back there. She works in our family business. For me, it's bigger than a lawsuit. It's more than that. It's about our kids knowing that entrepreneurship is not just opening a business. It's not just opening an LLC. It's being a job creator like our ancestors were. It's building wealth in our communities, and we have a big moment to switch that narrative and make sure that lawsuits stop, but the opportunity goes further than it ever could. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I think I have a, a question, right? Because I'm usually asking questions too, but what, what I would ask uh, Tawana and Kate is that as I was listening to Tawana talking, I was thinking about as one thing for corporations not to withdraw those dollars, it's something different for them to put more money in yeah, considering um, what's at risk here. But I was also thinking about how are they pushing it within those corporations? So are they using their government, so staff and, and policy drivers to drive policy? Because if they're not, to me, that's an action. That absolutely, that's trying to hit the nail on the head. A, a small sliver, the vast majority 
particularly in our market, I would argue, increase their governmental actions on just following George Floyd's murder, which is important. But those governmental actions have a huge opportunity to be operating in all lanes. And economics is what they get, it's what they know, it's what they do. And we get laughed out at the Capitol, we get laughed out in DC because they say, you know what? That company told you they were your partner, but they were just here yesterday arguing for lower taxes. So that washes out the argument on racial equity. It washes out the argument on equitable jobs. It washes out the argument on supplier diversity. It washes out all of that. Maxine Waters eats that a lot. So they've got to be making sure that their voice is completely lined up. I'm telling you, like I'm in her hearing, like it, it washes it all out and she's coming after them hard and fierce. So you've got to make sure that that voice is used as a lever. And the banks know that. The banks are scared to death of her. So they're saying, like, okay, we got a partner, right? We've got to be partnering deeply. And their voice, Sean is hitting it on the head. Wherever you bank, lift your voice. Your money counts. Lift your well, voice. Look at where they're lobbying. Absolutely. Right? Because they're, like, right. bringing up first, for example, you've got folks that are putting a lot of money into um, the lobbies. Absolutely. The police, and while they're talking about something yeah. here, they're doing something there. Yeah. And so I do think that when we're looking at building wealth, it is not just about what we can do to be scrappy and pull ourselves through. Mm -hmm. It is about the policy, the positioning, and the activism that we do to protect those policies and moving forward. The Supreme Court action is, I mean, there were states that had already moved on this, and there's evidence already that it has declined enrollment from brown and white folks going into those institutions. And so there is a lot to be done in terms of moving it forward. And everyone's lane is not going to be in the entrepreneurship space. Yeah. But what you can do is you can hire. You know, if you're in a hiring space, if you can contract people, if you can, I mean, there are so many ways for us to live into our purpose towards a greater mission of making sure that we are wealthy and sustained. I think you know if you're if you're not an entrepreneur. So let me just start there. If you are because if you are an entrepreneur, you are tired. And like um, <laughs> like Tawanda said, you're you might be scared, right? You're looking you're looking at the Supreme Court, or maybe you're not because you're like too fucking busy. Like you're just tired and you can't you can't look at it all. So if you are not an entrepreneur and you are someone who has resources or someone who has a voice or someone who can post on social media, do your best to support organizations that you care about, the women-owned businesses, the black-owned businesses, the brown-owned businesses, and make sure that they know that you support them and then act like it. Raise your voice, talk to the bank, talk to corporations, um, and, and do that legwork for them because everything that every day there's a new piece of legislation that's tearing us down as entrepreneurs or as leaders. Um, and at, at some point you have to just pay the bills. So I think, you know, there, there's every day you have to pay the bills, unfortunately, <laughs> apparently. Um, Apparently, the bills keep coming. So I just don't. They don't. But I just I want to be really honest in that in that you know, a lot of us are doing are doing entrepreneurial work that matters and that does good in the world. But we can't do it all. We can't we can't all testify. You know what I mean? We we sometimes need other people to do that heavy lifting for us, and so we look to our communities to do that. And that's also what radical resourcing is. Uh, I want to turn a question to Shada as we talk about nonprofits and other community-led groups. I think it's important. We also talk about them and it's an important piece of this puzzle. Um, talk about the current state of financing for these organizations. You know, we've seen a number of, of you know, individuals and a number of organizations just kind of like raising the flag and saying like, help, like we don't have the resources to be sustainable long-term. Um, so talk about the state of business and, and kind of how, um, how you see radical resourcing shifting in Flint. I think that um, what would I say? One is that it's not enough to one source. What I have learned in my time in, in philanthropy and is that people move in connection with resources very different. While I was at the Minneapolis Foundation, I would say the women of color, the leaders of color contacted me the least. Mm -hmm. That women contact you more with a question, the men contact you more with a demand, <laughs> right? It's more positioned of we are the best and you should be investing in us. 
facts. There, there are outliers in every situation. So I'm being, I'm broad brushing here that it is about the system and the systems do need to evolve. And there are people within non-involved systems that are evolved. But you don't know unless you are in relationship. Ultimately, it is a relational business. And you are positioning your business, whether or not you're an entrepreneur or a nonprofit leader to be invested in. So when people come and say, why aren't you investing in my nonprofit? They have, they're not giving the person anything to move through the system for the investment. Because if I have to make the case for you in the middle of um, being busy, I'm not, I'm not going to do it justice, right? So I'm sort of going more broadly is that there are wonderful ways to engage in philanthropy. But one of them, I would say, is engaging in philanthropy, right? that there is ownership on our end to send out emails and updates and invitations. And even if they don't attend, they read it. Even if they don't attend, how many times have you met someone and they're like, I feel like we've met before. <laughs> it's because I've sent you 100 emails. <laughs> um, and I hope you like them. Thank you. <laughs> you know? um, because you have to make yourself be known. And that is not different in philanthropy. Yeah. Right. And even if the idea is not perfect and it's not funded, doesn't mean that you can't develop a, a relationship with someone who can broker you into other relationships. Right. right. The no is just for that day. And so I think that the fragility in terms of how we move in this space will, will confuse us and confuse our own strength and power because someone else said no, and then we internalize it as though we're not worthy of investment. And I see that show up and I would even reach out. I think philanthropy, I think my role in philanthropy is to find those that are unfamiliar with working the system because those that are will find me, yeah. right? The ones that aren't comfortable, the ones that don't see their space, but are doing great work and have great ideas. That's really what the work is about. Is going out and finding that and bringing it in and developing confidence together so that they can go into another space and get another investment and another investment. And then they help another person, another woman, another Black woman do the same thing. And I think that's what it's about. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, before we turn it to you, but I hope you have a great question for me in the room. So I'll give you another question to think about. Uh, uh, before we turn to the audience here, um, I want to turn to solutions because you know we've talked a lot about you know some examples of radical resourcing. We've talked about what the challenges are for entrepreneurs and for nonprofits, but what are we seeing that's working? Um, that's something that was brought up in the very beginning. So, what transformative solutions are currently meeting the needs of women, business owners, and nonprofits? And I'll start with Kate. Sounds great. Um, <laughs> Well, as an inclusive design network, where I always look to solutions is the roots. Like, what can we look to historically from our traditions, pre-capitalist traditions, to really think about how we design new futures? And in my community, we do a lot of resource pooling and collective giving, right? That's one mechanism. One thing that I know we for sure don't need is a lot more capacity building. Like we don't need more, we don't need to train women entrepreneurs. We don't need, you know, specific fellowship programs necessarily specifically targeted to women of color. That's not what's needed. We have the we have the entrepreneurial spirit, we have the knowledge, we have the talent, we have the skills, we have the products. Everybody's taking them already. So I think there is a need for looking at new ways of moving capital that are reflective of our ethos and identities. We also have to look with, uh, like we can navigate the system and like learn how to navigate those systems, but also transform them from within those of us who are working within those systems. There's a there's a way to push and shift and change them. So, you know, Tawana, you talked a lot about corporations, but since we're sitting in a space hosted and funded by philanthropy, I'm going to call philanthropy in here too, right? We can't have our investment portfolios not reflect our values 
um, and our giving, like in our giving dollars. What we give out every year in philanthropy is a small drop in the bucket compared with what we're investing in annually, right? Philanthropies are banks, mostly. So I'll just say like, we need to think about how do we make our investments in ways that align uh, with things that matter to us. So, and that's true for every single sector, right? It's true for private sector, it's true for public sector, it's it's true for philanthropy. Um, and it's true for small businesses that are growing. We have to think about different ways of how we staff, how we invest in talent, how we keep our teams together. Um, the old ways aren't don't don't work for us. So that's just maybe a maybe an aside, Alex. Can you remind me what the actual original question <laughs> what's working? <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually think um there are lots of things that are working like uh like like low cost capital grant dollars for business owners, right? Like getting money specifically and directly to people who don't have access um to funds that come from their families so that they can actually grow and scale so they don't have to do what I did and wait to take a salary and have 750 classes like Alan. <laughs> um, those things, those things do work. Um, and people like Tawana are making them happen. So that's really exciting to me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tawana, will you answer that question? What's yeah. working? Yeah, I think there are a few things that are working. I think there are some formal things that are working. I want to shout out um, Fearless Commerce and the Activate Network. I think the formal celebration of women of color who are opening businesses, growing businesses, celebrating businesses, investing in their um, becoming certified and growing those businesses. Um, I know they just launched um, a walking circle of businesses and I wrote back like, you know, that's cool. Um, just because you need the support, like this work is lonely. You are, you mentioned being exhausted earlier. Like if you are exhausted at the end of the day, there's so much shout out to my team members, CEI team members, wave your hands here if you want to love my CEI. I um, love the team members being in the spaces, but there's also stuff like my crew is awesome. There's we've gone from like being four when we started. There's 32 of us now, we're constantly growing. But there's also stuff that like you just can't tell your team to, or you don't want to, because you don't want to stress them out. So you need that network. So shout out to all the formal groups who are starting networks. But I also love when I meet a business owner who's created their own network. I was on a panel with Dr. Watson from the North Side um, two weeks ago, and she was telling me about this whole crew of business owners that she just mentored informally. Like she meets somebody and then just builds a network and keeps mentoring them. And literally somebody came up to the two of us there and needed help, and she got them under her wing, gave resources. So I think that's working, right? When we just meet one another and they're like, sometimes I can't help you. Sometimes I don't know what you need, but then I connect you to somebody else. But sometimes I can, and that's working. Literally, that is growing and scaling businesses in our market in ways that I think doesn't get a lot of credit. But again, be that megaphone so that that gets called out and more and more of us know that is the opportunity to build drives and really transform our economy. Thank you. Um, Shonda, what are you seeing? Like, what solutions? Yeah, on top of um, those that were shared, I mean, you know, I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do with the Black Collective Foundation. And I say that not as um, one of the three co-founders, but of the community that's being built underneath it with community builders and others. And so pipelining new talent and new ideas, um, you know, thinking about working at one foundation where you're working to have it, um, Think about how it's in uh, relationship to community differently versus starting something that was built from the very beginning with a level of inclusivity and community in it is a very different way of being, right? So being intentional about everything in the fabric of that, that space. So the first million dollars that we put out were all to business owners that started businesses after 2020. Um, and that was very intentional. We grew out of that. We knew that others grew out of that, um, that they turned their, their frustration um, into action and that action into a business that we wanted to be supportive of that. So when I think about that community builders, then I think about the Women's Foundation and the Young Women's Initiative and that, you know, you may not be able to invest in the same way with everything, but you can have an investment strategy outside of just money. That is making sure that you are pipelining and supporting talent, creating space and opportunity for um, others that are less familiar to become more familiar with systems, institutions, formal philanthropy and investment opportunities. And so I think that that's working much better than what I've seen. Um, I also think that there is 
um, the conversation that was embedded and seeped and distance, right? Like part of even the evolution of the podcast and the things that I said is like, let's talk about issues that we talk about in our communities of comfort together. And so 2020 brought out issues around race, the disparities, how, I mean, we've been talking about disparities since for sure, I believe that, <laughs> right? So that's not a new conversation, but it felt new because now we're not talking about disparities, we're talking about race. And, and while it has been incredibly painful and there is a lot of work to do on that issue, at least we are having the conversation a little bit differently in terms of targeting who has been left behind in a different way, being very deliberate about what those strategies look like, that while whatever the intention may be, which I will not question, there have been more people that have been invited into tables. And I think that, um, you know, we have seen people retrench from that, but I think it's up for us to continue to move those forward. And then lastly, because governance is my thing, and I sit on a number of boards, um, when I, I do think that evolution of what governance could be in some cases are working, but I would not ignore the leadership and opportunity that is there when you are at a board seat. To, to push the conversation, being on a board is not about building a resume. It is an investment in making an impact and it's part of your impact portfolio. And if you don't see that, because you know you can go into things that you're completely aligned. I like going in some places where I can see that there's work mm -hmm. um, because that's my contribution to it. And so I do think that the way that we're leaning into what is now feels different. That even we're voicing our frustrations differently. And to me, that's working. It's a really exciting time to be on boards, to be involved, to put your dollars where, where they matter, um, put your time where it matters. Um, it's really exciting to be a leader in this community. So thank you. Thank, thank you for the three of you for leading, um, leading this change. I want to turn to the audience and see if there's any questions out there as we wind down our conversation. Hi, my name is Alina. Thank you so much. It's been super inspiring and thank you the whole world. So obviously making the space. You all mentioned in different points made references to mindsets and also to how the systems that we live in shape those mindsets, right? But I would like to like make it bring all of you back to what are the tactics maybe that you have found useful for yourself to realize, okay, this is a mindset that I have internalized. I know where it's coming from. It's not coming from necessarily just me, right? It's racism, it's sexism, it's family, it's stressful, it's everything. So how have you been able to manage stress those at a personal level to be able to achieve the top so far? Okay, one. So I um, you know, it's been interesting because I've been examining um, some of the lessons that I've been taught. So as a black woman, you know, you've got to work twice as hard to go half as time, right? Uh, that's a for sure one. And um, in a conversation I recently had, what Sean Macon said was that um, our ancestors were using that to support our drive. Mm -hmm. But what it does, though, is it says you'll never catch up. Yeah. Right. And so part of the work for me has been uncovering and unlearning the narratives that have caused me to second guess my progress. Mm -hmm. And that's my work. Very hard to follow that. <laughs> uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll plus I'll plus one that. And I think for me, I shared earlier that I didn't I didn't grow up with entrepreneurs in my life that I could look to. And I and actually my close community and family were not supportive of my entrepreneurial journey. Um, my partner now works for me, which is very un unheard of. <laughs> <laughs> Together, he, but he, he <laughs> <laughs> I, I did um, have to 
to kind of do several narratives in order to get to a place where I could be comfortable with even saying something like that out with saying that out loud. Um, and one of those things was being okay, one take like taking up space and and agreeing that I had something really unique to offer um, from the unique vantage point where I'm sitting in all of my identities. And on top, and, and that is not something that I was taught and or learned growing up that I should like facilitate the success of others, but not necessarily center my own. Um, Shonda also said something really profound earlier, like just in passing, because you know, that's what she does. But what you said was, you have to ask, right? And I realized pretty far into my entrepreneurial journey that I was waiting for others to jump on board with my agenda. And I actually have really had to change that mindset and recognize that I have to make my chances. <laughs> and I have, I have to make those chances like all the time. So if I want to meet with someone, I need to ask. I'm not, I need to not be deterred if they don't follow up to my first email. Yeah. I have to ask for the dollars that are going to actually make the work work well. I And I have to then fight for that and, and stand in, in that if someone says no. And I have to go after the next chance. And so I think that type of tenacity was always built in, but the willingness to take up space with firmness was really hard one. And I still work on that every day. That's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Oh, I have a question. So, um, for me, um, I did not struggle with that before living in Minnesota. Um, and I've been here for 13 years. Yeah. And Minnesota did a number. Yeah. Um, uh, and some days, if I'm not careful, it still does. <laughs> so, um, a couple things have worked for me. One was like having a Bush Fellowship and having time to just really sit with that. Um, and even that did it. So, a number on me with just some people who have that ends of that programming circle. Um, or to be just real quite transparent and in the room since, uh, since we committed to just keeping real yeah. in the room on this one. Um, but what I know now is one, having to do the work then to just like really go on a programming identity and get back to like who is Tawana? What is my ancestry? Not like what is Minnesota's black ancestry, but that go like what is mine? Because mine is y'all's. And then <laughs> that and be comfortable and confident in knowing like I know who I am and what I'm called to be and what I'm called to do. And I got to be really comfortable in that. But then when I come into a space, knowing that I expect that to be challenged. Like, because I know what I'm called to do, I should expect that when I come into a room or I come into an organization or I come into a task, I should expect it to be challenged because I know what God called me to do. But then I got to be comfortable with what my space is. So for instance, when I came into the room today, I need to stand. Like, I know that for Tawana to be comfortable, I need to stand. It's not unusual for me to stand through an entire church service because that's what gives me grounding or through an, a tour, like through an entire like event because that's what gives me grounding and allows me not to get off my like teeter of like who I am when other things come and start to get me like jumbled up in my head like I'm trying to said earlier like you get one no and then it messes up your whole psyche of like you start to internalize all kind of other people's junk like okay well but I will do that like I know that about me in Minnesota so then like okay I need to be like able to handle myself for me that means standing at an event it might mean in my office like something else right and maybe post-it notes all over my monitor through COVID so I can keep my face while I was also keeping my head together. But I think it's like figuring out what your thing is, but it starts with like being 100% core on, like what's my identity and what's my calling? And then what are the tricks that I have to have in place for me? So I never lose sight of it. And it doesn't mean that you don't lose sight of it for 10 minutes, but it can't be longer than 10 minutes. Because any more than that, then you're giving up too much of your purpose and the world can't afford that. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the power of the All three of these resonated so deeply with me. I feel I felt like yes, yes, and yes. And so I feel like um one thing that keeps me grounded or one thing that keeps me going is knowing that um I have a generation to take care of. I have two kids, I'm seven and eight year old. You don't have to have kids to like 
believe that you know your job is to make sure that the world is better um but it's hard and so when i see them every day and, and they believe that they're excellent and they don't give a shit like they're just like I'm excellent. like that's just their life and uh and i feel so grateful that i'm able to give them that gift uh but i know that when they walk out of the door the world is going to be something different and so it's my job to so it's my job to model what I know I am, that I know I am excellent. And so I don't beat up on myself at home. I don't talk about like stuff that I don't like about myself at home. I try really, really hard so that they see that I know that I'm excellent and then they know that they can be excellent no matter what comes at them during the day. Because mm -hmm. um, I can't control what's out, outside of my door, but I can't control the narrative of my house. Um, we are finished for this evening, and I just wish I could talk to you guys all that time. Um, which is why I'm like standing. Now I'm like, I can stand now. <laughs> um, but I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of this incredible conversation, this incredible initiative that the Women's Foundation led. Please give the shit a hand. Should we say? I talked a little bit about Santa Catholic earlier. We had good to <laughs> putting this event together a handful of months ago and just decided that you know this is something that this organization, the Covenant, is really passionate about, something that the Women's Foundation is really passionate about. And like, why not do something together? We've been talking about it for years. We're finally bringing it to light. Um, and I'm truly, truly honored to be up here facilitating this conversation with all of you. So I'm going to hand it over to Nadia before we close up tonight. Yep. Thanks, Alice. Hi, everybody. So I have met all of you all quick introduction, Nadia Siddiqui, Vice President of Advancement at the Women's Foundation. She and her pronouns, so excited to be up here where I can see all of your faces. Um, I just want to quickly offer a little bit more gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. And I think we need to do one more round of applause just to acknowledge the bravery it takes to be able to show up in front of all of these people and just give that like authentic truth of all of your life experiences and to be able to say the things that have been, um, have been hard. So thank you. And I also want to tell all of you and everybody here at this foundation, we are building out programming that is going to have a focus on entrepreneurship. So stay tuned for all of that to be in our heart to make sure we're getting capital out there in the community. Um, and I hope you all will join us for our next and final Coven Series event on September 20th, where we're going to talk about collective care. I think that one is called Heal the Hustle. So we're going to start talking about after we <laughs> <laughs> so and I just want to share one more thing that a lot of people still don't know about the Women's Foundation. We are the first statewide women's foundation in the country. So it is our 40th anniversary. I just want to be share that legacy. If you are here together in this event, you share this legacy in this country. So I just I really want all of us to move forward and be intentional in how we're spending our dollars. We heard it here tonight. Think about every single time you're going to a store, you're going to happy hour, wherever you're going, you're buying a gift for somebody. Think about who made that. Think about who owns that business. And let's just really lead with our values and, and just know like we we are doing it here in Minnesota. Things are gonna keep getting better. And um I'm gonna leave you just with a quick story. So we have so I'm going to talk about the Young Women's Initiative program. And we, um, you know, there's a couple different things happening, but one of the things that we do is these very small micro grants. And we find a cohort every single year of young women who are ages 16 to 24, and they have an idea for how they can create impact and bring a solution to their community. And so when we launched this program in 2016, we had a young woman a young woman, Noelle Ibrahim. She founded Henna and Hijabs. Does anybody know Henna and Hijab? <laughs> Some of you can have a So we gave her a little bit of seed funding, and soon she became the first company to produce medical grade hijabs. And then Nordstrom decided to pick up a product, and they were then selling the first ever hijab made by Henna and Hijab. 
And then this morning, a big announcement came out that Amazon is going to supply their employees across the entire world who want to wear a branded Amazon hijab, a hijab made by Halal's company. Uh, <laughs> possibility is around us, and it is in us, and it is happening. The transformation is getting there day by day. So I just want to share that with all of you, and thank you for being here. Stick around if you have a couple of minutes. There's a lot of incredible people in this room. I don't know if you know Marissa, the CEO of Girl Scouts. She's out of here. We've got a <laughs> We've got Hobones, Kevin Hobones from Seattle. We have Brianne, who leads economic development for the city of Brooklyn Park. She's putting capital out there for women every single day. So stick around, get to know each other, and hopefully we'll see you all on the 20th.